<laughs> COVID. So, uh, <laughs> well, what a joy it is to be here with you. I have been um, present for five of the six, and it just keeps growing and growing and growing. So this is uh, uh, an exciting thing for me as a preacher to look at and to see so many people, but not just people, but eager hearts. It, it tells me a lot about you to come to a conference like this. There, there's not a lot of, in fact, there's no entertainment, and there's not a lot of curb appeal. It, we just sing, worship, preach, and hug one another. So that's kind of what the conference is. And I'm so grateful for, for Richard and your leadership in this conference. And I just loved the singing that we just did, especially um, singing that first hymn. So uh, it, it's my privilege to be here, and I get to preach twice tonight. Uh, tonight, I'm going to be doing later my best Paul Washer impression, okay? <laughs> so uh, just buckle your pew belt, okay? <laughs> I brought fastballs tonight. So uh, no, I, I am thrilled to be here, and and the, the topic that has been assigned to me is preaching in perilous times. Well, when else do we preach <laughs> but in perilous times? Um, the role of the pulpit in discernment. And so I texted uh, Richard and asked him, so if you were preaching this, what text would you preach from? And so he texted back 1 John 4, 1 through 6. So if you like this, you can thank me. If you don't like it, blame Richard, okay? <laughs> because that's going to be our passage for tonight. So I want to invite you to take your Bible. Let's just dive right into this. 1 John chapter 4, and we're going to look at verses 1 through 6. I really wish I had time to develop the path I was going to go down. This text was so critically important in the time of the Great Awakening as the Spirit of God was moving in the colonies in an unprecedented manner, arguably the greatest movement of the Spirit of God on American soil ever. And as George Whitfield and Jonathan Edwards, as well as many others, preached the Word of God, it, it stirred things up. And untold numbers were converted. Um, there were some 300 churches that were just spontaneously planted with no strategy whatsoever. And it created quite a stir And between what was known as the old lights and the new lights. And the old lights were those who wanted no emotion in church. They were the bland leading the bland. <laughs> and... And then Edwards and Whitfield were preaching so passionately that it was creating a great deal of emotion, some of it too much. And so on July the 8th, 1741, Edwards preached, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God at Enfield, and it just blew the roof off. It would be exactly two months later that Yale would convene for commencement, and the board was divided between the old lights and the new lights. And there seemed to be no resolution, no way to move forward. And it just so happened that a 38-year-old Jonathan Edwards had already been scheduled to preach the next day. And Edwards preached a sermon that was printed within one month entitled, The Distinguishing Marks of a Work of God's Spirit. And this was his text. And I really wanted to bring you Edwards' message tonight, which might be better than mine. <laughs> but I say all this, I want you to know the importance of this text of Scripture, that in the midst of one of the most turbulent times in the colonies, under the heat of the Great Awakening, God used this passage to steer the church forward into a safe harbor. 
So with that by way of introduction, I want to begin by reading the text. I want to begin by reading the passage, setting it before your eyes, and everything that I'll have to say tonight will flow from this text. So begin reading in verse 1, 1 John 4, verse 1. This is God's inspired, inerrant, and infallible word. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, of which you have heard that it is coming, and now it is already in the world. You are from God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is He who is in you than he who is in the world. They are from the world, therefore they speak as from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God. He who knows God listens to us. He who is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. In these verses, we clearly see the need for discernment in difficult times. Perilous times are usually seasons of chaos and confusion in the world. And it has its effect upon the church as well. Perilous times become the opportunities for the sowing of damnable heresies in the church, because the church in difficult days has a way of taking their eye off the Lord Jesus Christ and become concerned with what's going around, on around them on a horizontal basis. It is when the world is in upheaval that the devil is best able to make inroads into the minds of unsuspecting people who are naive and gullible in times of turmoil. It is in tumultuous times of uncertainty that the pulpit must be the one place where the truth is most clearly heard. With the overturning of society, with the tearing down of, of, of morals, with the proliferation of reprobate minds spewing its lies in the midst of the death of the culture, with the vanquishing of all human decency, with the propaganda of the crooked and perverse generation, brainwashing people on every side. The pulpit must speak the truth in love. This was certainly the case in the first century. At the end of the first century, as the early church was, was really under the heavy heel of the Roman Empire, the church was about to sail into threatening storms of extreme persecution. Domitian is about to unleash all hell on earth upon the church. And in the midst of this difficulty, the heresy of Gnosticism had begun making inroads into the church. And among its many lies, and time does not permit me to trace out all of Gnosticism, but of all of its many lies, its most damnable lie was the corruption of the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, as it denied the, the deity and denied the humanity of Christ. And so, therefore, that unplugs the cross of all power. And so, John, the last living apostle, must address the church in the midst of perilous times and to sort out with clarity the gospel. So as we walk through this passage tonight, I have five headings. 
that I want to set before you. And I want you to note first the discernment, the discernment needed. And John begins with what is the duty of every believer. Notice how he begins in verse 1, beloved, which is a term of affection that, of which he speaks towards every believer. He says, do not believe every spirit. It's an imperative command. It's in the present tense. Stop believing every spirit. Stop being so gullible. Stop being so foolish. Stop being so naive. Stop being so undiscerning. Do not buy everything you hear. That is what John is saying to the first century church, and as it's recorded in the canon of Scripture, this is what God is saying to His church tonight. When he says, do not believe every spirit, that clearly implies there's more than one. That there's more than just the Holy Spirit. It implies that there are other spirits in the world, and that would be demon spirits. Paul spoke of it in 1 Timothy 4 verse 1, deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. And these demon spirits are the power behind so many preachers and so many teachers. And so he says, but test the spirits. And the word test here is a, is a, a Greek word that means to test something to prove its authenticity or to determine whether it is fake or fraud. It was used, for example, of putting a, a metal into... Uh, a fiery furnace to see, is this a real metal that will go through the fire, or is it just going to melt down because it's a counterfeit? So he says, test the spirits. Uh, these spirits are unseen, but they are more real than what you do see. Test the unseen spiritual influences behind every human preacher. Just because they stand in a pulpit does not mean that they are from God. The spirits, these spirits govern the minds of so many preachers and direct the thoughts and the, and the words of so many preachers. And so Paul is, uh, excuse me, John is having to say to the early church, you need to test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Now, that clearly implies there is a Spirit, the Spirit, who is from God, the Holy Spirit, who has been sent by the Father and by the Son into the world to carry out the eternal purpose and plan of God, to be the great executor and administrator of the church, the great teacher of the church. But there are other spirits that are not from God. And what John is saying here is you need to discern between truth and error. You need to discern between the pure and the vile. You, you need to discern between what is of God and what is of Satan. There are no other options. You need to discern between divine revelation and satanic reason, between heavenly wisdom from above and hellish wisdom from below. So, again, this clearly implies that there are two kinds of preachers with two different spirits that are empowering them and energizing them and teaching them, and directing them, and every false prophet speaks by way of another spirit, a demon spirit. These false teachers are not in a state of neutrality. They are not innocent. They are being ruled and used by the forces of darkness. So it's the responsibility 
of every person here tonight to test the spirits. And just because you hear something or read something does not mean that it is from God. So this leads now second to the danger. The second half of verse 1, here is why this is so critically important and absolutely necessary. This is why you and I must be on red alert. He says beginning in the middle of verse 1, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Many, not a few, many. It's a Greek word that means great numbers, a a, a proliferation of, of false teachers and false prophets. And this is never said of many true preachers of the true gospel. And it can be argued, I think, very easily that there are more false prophets than there are true preachers. The many are on the broad road headed for destruction, and the few are on the narrow path. And that applies not only to the congregations, but also to the pulpits. So he says, because many false prophets prophets have gone out into the world. They they claim to speak for God. They they call themselves believers. They may hold up a Bible and say they believe what's in the Bible. They may use biblical vocabulary, but the fact of the matter is they, they are fraudulent fakes. They are wolves in sheep's clothing who are controlled by demon spirits. They're not that smart to say what they're saying. There is a higher intelligence that is giving them this stuff and enabling them to have massive sway over people. Now, they've gone out into the world, this says. They've flooded the market. They they have infiltrated the world, and they have infiltrated the church. They have saturated the landscape. And the verb tense here says they've already been dispersed. This is at the end of the first century. Imagine what it is today with with just the multiplication of of communication, uh, how much more uh, false teaching there is that is out there. Jesus warned it would be this way. Jesus said in Matthew 24, verse 11, many false prophets will arise and will mislead many. Many false prophets will mislead many. And in Matthew 7, verse 15, Jesus said, beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Oh, they look so slick on the outside, but on the inside, they have the devil's initials carved in their heart. The Apostle Paul ran into this. You remember in Acts chapter 13, the Spirit of God said, set apart Paul and Barnabas to this work to which we have called them, and so they are commissioned by the other five men there in in Antioch, and they they are sent out Paul's first missionary journey of the three missionary journeys that are recorded for us in the book of Acts. Guess who he runs into first? It's verse 6. He just got sent out in verse 3, and he runs head on into the devil. And in Acts 13, verse 6, it says, when they, referring to Paul and Barnabas, had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they found a magician, a Jewish false prophet, whose name was Bar-Jesus. And then in verse 8, he was opposing them and seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. He, he had no more stepped off the airplane to begin his missionary journey. First person he runs into, false prophet. That's no coincidence. 
I'd be willing to say if you just go turn on television tonight, the first person you see may be a false prophet. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 13, such men are false apostles and deceitful workers disguising themselves. They're, 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 they're con men disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. Paul said in Acts 20, verse 29, I know that after my departure to the elders at Ephesus. Can you imagine this? Paul has poured his life into the elders at Ephesus for at least three years training them, teaching them, discipling them. And he says, I know as soon as I leave here, there's gonna, it's going to create a vacuum, and there are going to be false prophets that are going to be sucked into this vacuum. They're everywhere. It's like turning on a light in the middle of the summer in Houston. Every mosquito around is just drawn to it. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples from you. I'll give you one more cross-reference, 2 Peter 2, verse 1. False prophets arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly induce destructive heresies. Verse 2, many, there's our word again, many will follow their heresies. And that wasn't just for the first century. Every century of church history has been plagued by these false teachers. The time of the Reformation, the 16th century, is a time that we love to read about. We love Luther and Calvin and Tyndale and Knox, mighty men of, of God. And in the English Reformation, the greatest preacher of the English Reformation was a man named Hugh Latimer. He was the one who was strapped to the stake with, with Ridley, Nicholas Ridley, and said, play the man, Mr. Ridley. We shall light a fire here in uh, this day in England that shall never be extinguished, as they were burned at the stake as Marian martyrs. Well, Hugh Latimer preached probably what is arguably the most famous sermon of the entire English Reformation. It's called Sermon, on, sermon of the Plow, like plow out in the field. And let me just read you a portion of this because what he has to say is more up to date than tomorrow's newspaper. He said, who is, and he's preaching to a large contingency of preachers, who is the most diligent bishop in all of England, who surpasses all the rest in doing his office? I can tell you, for I know who it is, I know him very well. I think I see you listening and asking that I should name him. There is one bishop who surpasses all other bishops. He is the most diligent preacher in all of England. Will you know who it is? I will tell you. It is the devil. He is the most diligent preacher of all. He is never out of his district. You shall never find him unoccupied. He is ever in his parish. He keeps residence at all times. You shall never find him out of the way. Call for him, and he is ever at home. He is the most diligent preacher in, in all the realm. He is ever at his plow. He is ever applying his business. You shall never find him idle. And so it is. The devil is ever at his work. While we sleep, he works. While we go to work, he works. And he is ever spreading his damnable lies. Nothing has changed. The devil has his mouthpieces at the plow, in the field, in churches, in seminaries, on television, on radio, in bookstores, on the internet, in cults, in false religions in liberal denominations, in the Catholic Church, 
in the church of Christ with the Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, Christian science, the prosperity gospel, the devil is ever at work. That's the danger. And you and I need to understand this. We need to understand, I mean, we spend so much time in the holy huddle. We need to understand what's going on out there. This leads to third now, the doctrine. In verses 2 and 3, we see the, the doctrine, and here is the fixed standard that separates the true from the false. So he says in verse 2, by this you know, and by that, what he is saying is, by this you discern, uh, by this you detect the Spirit of God. This is how you know where the Spirit of God is at work. And this was Jonathan Edwards' whole argument that September of 1741. This is how you can know a real work of God. It is where there is a preacher who is indwelt by the Holy Spirit, who is taught by the Holy Spirit, and who is moved by the Holy Spirit to teach the truth. And here is the chief criteria. He, he, he says every spirit, and when he says spirit here, every spirit, he, he, he's talking about, in this case, the Holy Spirit at work in the human spirit of a God-called man. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. He, he, he narrows his focus it, 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 with myoptic vision. It's almost like tunnel vision. Out, out of all the ten areas of systematic theology, bibliology, theology proper, Christology, pneumatology, angelology, uh, anthropology, hermitology, soteriology, ecclesiology, eschatology. That's the full counsel of God. John narrows his focus to only one of those ten divisions of systematic theology, the person and work of Christ. It is the, what we call the testing doctrine. And if you're right here, you're going to be right in 50 other places. But if you're wrong here, you're going to be wrong in 100 other places. You tell me what you believe about the person and work of Jesus Christ, and I'll tell you 50 other things you believe. So John goes straight to the juggler vein, and he says that every true preacher who is empowered by the Holy Spirit confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh and is from God. Now, that's a very minimalistic sentence, and we could have entire volumes of systematic theology to, to spread this out, but, but this is just the tip of the spear. This is the peak of the mountain. This is just isolating in few words the very essence of it that Jesus Christ is God in human flesh, that He is truly God truly man, and that he has been sent by God the Father into this world on a mission of salvation and redemption, and the rest of the book of 1 John can help us flesh that out. In fact, the whole rest of the Bible fleshes this out. And so, John is putting his finger on the very vital nerve in the body of Christ you must confess that Jesus Christ is God and has come from God. You remember when Jesus asked the disciples, who do men say that I am? Well, some say you're John the Baptist, and others say you're uh, Jeremiah, and others say you're a prophet. Who do you say that I am? You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Peter nailed it on that day. And so this is what John is, is driving for. 
Now, we just need to understand this, and I'm, I'm just going to do this very briefly. The Gnostic heresy made a false division between the physical and the spiritual. And they said all physical is evil and repugnant to God, and all spiritual is good. So because of that, they denied the virgin birth and the the death of Christ upon the cross and the bodily resurrection because that would take place in a physical body. So they denied the humanity of Christ, and at the same time, they denied the deity of Christ and and really downgraded Him to to being just a, a, a ghost of some kind. And so John, as he writes this this book, he brings clarity to the issue of the day in the midst of perilous times. If you would turn back to the first chapter, the first three verses of this book, it'd be worth us just to take a a quick look at the first three verses of 1 John 1, because John at the very beginning just turns all of his cards over. We know exactly where he's headed in this book. So it says in verse 1 of 1 John 1, what was from the beginning, and that's intended to sound much like the gospel of John that he has probably already written in a chronological timeline, and we're in the early 90s, at the end of the first century. What was from the beginning, referring to eternity past? Then he says what we have heard. (laughs) We actually heard with our own ears a real person speak to us. We heard it. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. We we heard it. That was a real person. And then he adds, what we have seen with our eyes. We actually saw a real human body. He, he, He wasn't a figment of our imagination. He he, he wasn't a a ghost or just a spirit. God had prepared a body for him. He he was born of of a woman, Galatians 4, verse 4. And then to go even beyond that, he says, what we have looked at and touched with our hands. I mean, we reached, we reached out and, and touched Him. He is the Son of God, the Son of Man, who has come from, from heaven to earth so that we can go from earth to heaven. He, he was born of a virgin so that we could be born again. He, he came here on a rescue mission of salvation. God came to earth in the person of His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he defines him at the end of verse 1 concerning the word of life. And the life was manifested, and the word manifested means to be, to be made visual. We, 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 we saw him just like we saw any other person, any other man. He was a real man, yet without sin. And now he wraps it up and he says, and we have seen and testified and proclaimed to you the, the eternal witness, which was with the Father. You see that word with? It's used in John 1, verse 1, to begin the gospel of John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God and was God. That little preposition with, pros, P-R-O-S, it means literally face to face, in the face of. And in eternity past, John 1 verse 1 is saying that Jesus was the eternal Son of the living God, was face to face throughout all the ages before creation with the Father in the most intimate of relationship. And verse 18 says that He was in the bosom of the Father, meaning He just It's a picture of intimacy and close fellowship to lay your head upon the the bosom of the person next to you. That's how close Jesus was to the Father before He came into this world. This is the very same pros that is used here in 1 John 1 verse 2, which was with the Father. 
face to face and was manifested to us. And the implication is face to face. We, we traveled with him for three years. We ate with him. We heard him. And he says it again in verse 3, which we have seen with our own eyes and heard with our own ears, we proclaim to you so that you may have fellowship with us. Now, if you don't buy into this, you'll never have fellowship with us because only true believers can have fellowship one with another. And so John begins his whole epistle that the acid test to discern between the true and the false in the spiritual realm is the person and work of Jesus Christ. Jesus was eternal deity, creator of all creation, yet himself uncreated, sent by the Father, born of a virgin without a sin nature. He was God in human flesh, truly God, truly man, fully God, fully man, co-equal and co-eternal with the Father and the Spirit. He is the Son of God and the Son of Man who lived a sinless and perfect life who died a substitutionary, sin-bearing, wrath-absorbing death upon the cross. He was buried, raised, ascended, and is now enthroned at the right hand of God the Father. And the advocate for all who put their trust in Him, 1 John 2, verse 2, and He's never lost a case. So that's the positive doctrine. That's the sound doctrine. And if you're wit witnessing to some cult, you just make a beeline to the Lord Jesus Christ. You don't need to go down all the other rabbit trails. Now, the negatives in verse 3, because there's a flip side to this. Verse 2 is what the Holy Spirit is doing in the world in the preaching of the Word of God and in the hearts and minds of those for whom it is intended. But verse 3, and every spirit, meaning behind every human preacher, there is a spirit. It's either a capital S, Holy Spirit, or a small s, an unregenerate preacher. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus, does not confess that He is truly God, truly man, fully God, fully man, that, that does not confess His sinless humanity, the God-man, He says, is not from God. That means He's from the devil. That means he's under the influence of demons. He then adds, this is the spirit of the Antichrist. And there is a weightiness about that. Anti meaning the opposite of and in opposition to. He is the opposite of Christ and is in opposition to Christ Hey, he is both a false teacher with false teaching, of which you have heard. Yeah, they'd heard it. They heard it from Paul. They heard it from Peter. They heard it passed down to them from Jesus. They, they heard of it from the prophets, the false prophets, the false shepherds, Ezekiel and Jeremiah. He says about the Antichrist, that is coming. Oh, there will be at the end of the age one final demon-obsessed, demon-possessed man who will be the Antichrist, the beast out of the field, out of the sea. Oh, he's coming. And now it is already in the world. That that 
that spirit that will turbocharge the Antichrist in the last days, that spirit is already loose in the world. And, it's man- and these spirits are manipulating con men in pulpits and on so-called Christian television. What John is writing to the church in the first century is a needed wake-up call. And I think we need the same wake-up call. I'm not really big in spiritual warfare. I I really rarely ever preach on it. I'm only doing it tonight because Richard suggested that I do this tonight. (laughs) But there it is in my Bible. I'm certain it's in your Bible. If it's in the Bible, we're all in. We believe it. So look in verse 4, the deliverance. Because there has been a deliverance of every believer out of the world and the evil world system. So he begins verse 4, you, referring to the beloved, verse 1, referring to true believers, you are from God. What that means is you have been born of God, you have been taught by God, you are indwelt by God, God the Holy Spirit. He calls them little children. John is in his 90s. Everyone is a little child (laughs) when you're 90 plus. But notice this. You are from God and, not or, and. It's a package deal. And have overcome them. Who's the them? The them is the false prophets who are now in the world. Because you too once were a part of the world system over which Satan presides, which is anti-God, anti-Christ, anti-values, Christian values, anti-family, etc. He says, you have overcome them. And the word overcome comes into the English language, interestingly enough, as Nike. Nikeo is the verb. You have conquered them. You have defeated them. You have prevailed over them. And the imagery here is of spiritual warfare. So how is it that we have overcome the duping that everyone else is so susceptible to? He says, because, you see that in the middle of verse 4, because greater, and that's a Greek word, megas, you can hear mega, (laughs) far greater in rank, far greater in authority, far greater in power, because greater is he, who is the he? It's the Holy Spirit. Uh, He's mentioned here in chapter 3, verse 24, uh, chapter 4, verse 2, chapter 4, verse 6. Because greater is the Holy Spirit who is in you. He is sovereign. He is omnipotent. Because greater is he who is in you than he, referring to the devil, and all of the demon spirits put together, who is in the world. It's not a fair fight. It's not a cosmic tug of war. And if we could just get a few more believers over here on this side of the rope, we, we might could overcome all of the flaky people over here. No. All we need is sovereign, omnipotent God on one side of the rope. And we just get out of the way. So how is it that you have come to believe? Because you were blinded by the God of this age, 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4. You were spiritually dead in your trespasses and sin. You you had no moral ability whatsoever, period, paragraph. How 
how is it that you have come to believe in the midst of being in the kingdom of darkness and under the, the lockdown of a real devil and his demonic hosts, how is it that you were sprung loose? It's because greater is he who's in you than he who is in the world. And the Holy Spirit of God has come into the world to convict men of sin and righteousness and judgment, and he brought that conviction to your heart And then he drew you, literally he dragged you and overcame your resistance and brought you to the the Lord Jesus Christ and he sovereignly regenerated you. He, He birthed you into the kingdom. What did you do to be born physically? Nothing. And that's why Jesus used that image in John chapter 3 that except you be born again, you will not see the kingdom of God. It was all a work of God, the Holy Spirit, who brought you into his kingdom. And no matter how hard the devil and demons and darkness tried to hold you back in the appointed day, at the appointed time, he made you willing in the day of his power. That's how we got here. Or you would be at some other church. (laughs) Hey, I'm a truth teller, okay? (laughs) I'm just telling you the truth in love. (laughs) No, you would. You would be lost. You'd be perishing. You, You would be blind. You would be deaf. You, 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 would be, you would be as lost as lost could be until this one who now indwells you overcame the stranglehold that the devil once had on your life. And even if you grew up in a wonderful church like this and won every Awana award that could be, could be won... Until you're born again, you're in a different family. That's why you have to be born again. Because your first birth was so bad spiritually. It may have been okay physically. You may look like your mom, and that's fine. (laughs) But spiritually, it was an awful birth. You were separated from God. You were estranged from God. You, You were born... You were born stillborn. You were born dead until the Holy Spirit did His work in your soul. You know that's true. All right, I want you to see the last heading I have, verses 5 and 6, the division. Because there's a continental divide that runs through the world. You know what the Continental Divide is? One drop of water on one side of the Continental Divide ends up, goes down slopes and into creeks and streams and rivers, and one way or another ends up in the Atlantic Ocean. One drop of water on the other side, if it flows long enough, ends up in the Gulf of Mexico. There's a Continental Divide right here that separates the world. So notice verse 5. It begins with a negative. He goes negative, positive, negative in these two verses. He begins with the negative. They, referring to the false teachers, the many false teachers, they is plural, right? And it's just an allusion to the, to the many false teachers. They are, present tense right now, from the world. What that means is they're the product of the world. They're the poster child of the world. They're the mouthpiece for the world. Like produces like. Like preaches like. They're from the world. Therefore, they speak as from the world. Just listen to them. They have a worldly message, worldly wisdom, 
Worldly philosophy, worldly thinking, worldly mindset, worldly values, worldly perspective, worldly agenda, carnal, fleshly message with just some Bible words scrambled in. It is the prosperity gospel. If you want to drum up a crowd, just tell them, I'm going to make you rich and I'm going to make you healthy. And they'll be like lap dogs following you. They, they, they don't address the heart. They don't address discipleship. They don't address repentance. That would empty the building. It'd be all over. They'd have to go back to being a weatherman or something on, <laughs> on television. Every salesman knows, give the people what they want. If they're unregenerate and unconverted, give them a worldly message and they will line up. And on top of that, they'll bankroll you. Notice he says in verse 5, and the world listens to them. And when he says the world, he's talking about the unconverted, unsaved masses. And when he says listens to them, he, he means that they listen with an open mind and an attentive ear, with a glad reception. They eat it up and they drink it in. The world listens to them. The them refers to these false teachers who deny the true Christ. They preach another gospel. They preach another Christ that the flesh loves to hear about. Now, verse 6, the positive. We, and when he says we, referring to John and the, the other writers of Scripture and true teachers of the Word, we are from God. We, we have been sent by God. We, we, we have been born of God. We have been taught by God. We have been commissioned by God. We are men of God with the message of God, the gospel of God. We are from God. He who knows God, I love this, listens to us. There have been many a times I've, I've, I've at least thought it. You don't like my preaching. That's more of a commentary on you than it is on me. I'm just the messenger. I'm just sowing the seed. And if you're of God, you're going to eat it up. You're going to have two moleskins to write it down. Now he goes back to the negative. He who is not from God, unregenerate, unconverted, spiritually dead, not from God, referring to an unbeliever, does not listen to us. You don't have an appetite for our message. And the fact of the matter is, 1 Corinthians 2, verse 14, the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit, for they are spiritually discerned. You're not on the wavelength to grasp the message and to internalize it. By this we know... John wraps this up. The spirit of truth, by this we know where the Holy Spirit is at work, by this we know where the pure, unvarnished, unadulterated gospel and truth of the Lord Jesus Christ is being preached and being received. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. You, you will be able to discern and to differentiate between the true and the false because you have the Holy Spirit inside of you. I don't have time to take us there, but when you go home tonight or wherever you're staying, you can look at 1 John 2, 19 to 27. 1 John 2, 19 to 27. 
And John says, of every believer, you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you have no need for anyone to teach you. Now, it's referring to a false teacher. You have no use for a false teacher. They, don't, they, 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 they cannot teach you anything that is of any profit to your soul. God has given gifted men to the church, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. You need teachers. You just don't need false teachers. And I believe that the hottest part of hell is reserved for these charlatans. Well, I need to wrap this up. One joy of preaching is you don't even know what time it is. And I just, I just see the clock right here. So we're going to take a break. But let me just conclude with this. I, I, I can't let you off the hook just right now. Has God ever rescued you from this world system? Has God the Holy Spirit ever convicted you of your sin? You know, no one skips through the narrow gate. No one giggles into the kingdom. We all come with a heart wound because we've been crushed by the heavy yet loving hand of the Holy Spirit who has convicted us of sin and righteousness and judgment. Has this ever happened in your life? Have you ever been drawn by the Holy Spirit to the Lord Jesus Christ? Has He opened your eyes and opened your ears? Has He opened your heart? Has He ever performed an open heart transplant? Has he ever taken out your heart of stone and given you a heart of flesh? Have you ever called upon the name of the Lord? I want you to know that there is salvation in no other name, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Jesus is the only Savior of the world. There are many roads to hell. There's only one road to heaven. It is the one who said, I am the way. And the truth and the life, no one comes to the Father but through me. And it may just be that as you find yourself here tonight in this first session, that unknown to you, but now you begin to realize that the Spirit of God is awakening you from your slumber and coming to the realization that you need to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, that to this point you simply have been going through religious empty motions, but that now you begin to sense the Holy Spirit at work, even tonight. If you've never believed upon Christ, the Bible says, Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, today is the day of salvation. The message is not go home and pray about it. The message is right now in this pew, repent of your sin and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And this would be the greatest day in your life. Jesus said, him who comes unto me, I will in no wise cast out. He's the friend of sinners. And he would gather you up in his arms of grace if you would come to him by faith and put your full trust in him, I know him. He would receive you. Let us pray. Father, we need discernment. Even we can tend to be rather naive at times and unsuspecting. And we need to be, be aware of false prophets. So, Lord, use this study from this text tonight to heighten our sense of discernment that we might listen 
to those who are sent from God. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.